it. So we've moved on to the slightly less stomach turning, quite literally in the scrub hairs case, stomach turning part of our anatomy lesson. Now we see all sorts of different animals out on safari, one of which of course is the magnificent elephants and you can imagine that their entire body is structured not just to be able to support their weight but to be able to manage in different ways in dealing with being an animal that size. So first of all we're going to have a quick look at the clip that we have and what I want you to focus on while we're watching, I remember this was beautiful big elephant bull in Kenya one that actually was so special he was collared. I want you to look at the way that the feet move, the trunk moves now as it's wrapping around the grass. Look at the flexibility of movement within it and the way in which they are able to maneuver their trunk backwards and forwards. And of course, as you most of you know, and I'm probably going to leave that diagram out, the way in which the elephant's ears used to cool it down. <laughs> look at that. Look at the way the trunk's being used to drink water while swimming. So even <laughs> though possibly tasting it. And then of course we have the flare as well, which just picks up on those heat patterns around the elephant's ears. And in this case, the elephant not actually giving up, giving off an enormous amount of a heat. Okay, so from there, what I want to show you is, first of all, the way in which an elephant trunk works. Because an elephant trunk is a truly amazing thing. It's a muscular hydrostat. What that means is that there are no bones. We always talk about the fact that there are no bones within an elephant's trunk. But in that case, how does it work? It works in just the way that your, same way that your tongue does. So a muscular hydrostat is basically supported by the solidness of the of the fluid, of the, essentially water with stuff diluted in it. So as you know, water is pretty much incompressible. You can't compress water. So that basic principle is what governs the way that an elephant trunk moves, or the way that it, it moves and the strength that it has. That means that it has to stay the same volume. So if you stretch out your tongue, it extends but it becomes narrower in diameter. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> I caught you. I was going to go very quickly there. If you flatten your tongue and pull it into your mouth, it becomes wider. So it has to stay exactly the same volume. Now from there we always talk about just how many muscles an elephant trunk has. Well I've done my best attempt at an oversimplified drawing of an elephant's trunk which is over there and what we're going to do is we're going to have a look, a closer look at it and I'm going to show you the relevant parts of it using my special stick. Now these cross hatchings here represent the different layers of muscle. Now it's an oversimplification because most of an elephant's muscles are radial muscles but the top layer here is perpendicular muscle fibers. So this is the top layer over here and below that there are several sort of crossed muscles so that they go sort of across the trunk and allow it a large amount of sideways and twisting motion and then within the trunk as well there are also particularly around this is where this is the two tubes of the nostril they are basically perpendicular to the nostril itself so there you go, that is what a, an elephant's trunk looks like and then the parallel muscles obviously going across on top as well. And what that does is it allows a huge amount of movement from within the elephant's trunk. So it stretches forward and becomes thinner, it pulls back, it can turn in a way that our, my arm can't demonstrate because I'm, I've got bones in my arm so you know I'm, I'm restricted by where my joints are but it can twist right around and that ultimately gives the elephant the ability to not only pull down a branch but to pick up something as tiny as a matchstick say not that they would want to pick up a matchstick but a matchstick if they wanted to now it creates this unbelievably flexible extra limb that must be so pleasant to have an extra limb for them of course they, they walk on four legs so they don't have hands but that also allows them to drink without having to bend down to get to the water which would make them very vulnerable and at the same time at the same time it would also allow the 
elephant to move food to its mouth rather than the other way around. Joy wants to know if all muscles are hydrostats. I mean, in the sense that they're made up, uh, every bodily organ, we're, we're mostly water. So we're not really all that compressible. In, and so, yes, in a sense, but it specifically refers to a combination of different structures, almost like an organ, that combine together to make a functional unit. Does that make sense? So a muscle on its own is not a functional unit. A muscle of, say, biceps combined with triceps that levers an arm, that makes a functional unit in the same way that the the trunk is made up of all of these muscle fibers and depending on how you count the different muscles you know they say anything from 50,000 to 100,000 different muscles in an elephant's trunk those are all working together for one specific purpose I have one other quickly diagram that I want to show you of a cross section of an elephant's trunk so I'm just gonna switch the diagram round quickly so you have a look at those pretty skulls while while I do that and I'll switch it round. This is Faith's favourite. Well, I think it's her favourite. I like to think it's her favourite. This is Faith's favourite. This is um, she calls it the, the, dread, the dreadlocked, um, the dreadlocked. What did you call it? Alien, a rusta alien. <laughs> so this is a cross section of an elephant's muscles. So you've got the sort of or the trunk. So these are the nostrils here, the perpendicular muscles and the perpendicular muscle fibers running all the way along. This is the top part, this is the bottom part. And then blood vessels as well, of course, because the muscle fibers have to be, and the nerves and everything like that, have to be supply, supplied with the vital, whether it's uh, to oxygenate them or whatever it happens to be, they need to be supplied with those substances. And then radial muscle fibers that radiate out and allow a lot of that twisting motion that we were talking about. Now, I've had great fun drawing diagrams recently. I cannot draw anything, but I can copy and I can combine ideas, which is essentially what I've been doing over the entire weekend, because well, who needs a weekend? So that is the way in which an elephant trunk works. Now, the next section that, of course, we would love to talk about, but first we're going to wait to answer Francesca. Francesca's question. That's a really good one. Francesca wants to know, you know, how does short trunk cope without a proper trunk? Now, short trunk's missing about, I would say, a quarter of the end part of her trunk. I suppose it depends on how compressed or expanded it is, but I'd say it's about a quarter, give or take, in volume. So she's missing those incredibly flexible and very dexterous finger-like protrusions at the end. However, if you watch her, she's learned to use it almost as efficiently, and she can twist it. She's still got that range of motion, and she can pluck things. It's not as neatly done as it is for other elephants and she can also use it to drink so her nostril openings are not blocked she can still draw water up into the trunk and then transfer it to her mouth so there's i mean short trunk is is pretty well adapted however i do think there's a chance that in the beginning wherever she had that whenever she got that injury whether it was from a snare or possibly a crocodile whenever it happened I think that's how she got split away from the rest of her herd I don't think she was able to keep up I don't know if she was stuck for a while perhaps she was injured and ill and eventually I suspect I will never know I suspect her herd left her and moved on and maybe a younger sister stayed with her because I'm not sure that the eldest female with her is her daughter. I think there might be some other familial connection there. And then, of course, she went on to have the young male and the young female. Sorry, I saw movement in the tree outside. Um, Darby, can you zoom in on that marula tree? What is in that tree? Is that a, no, the marula tree. The dead one. The de no, the live one, sorry. It's that one there. What is in that tree? It looked, I thought for one second, but I think it's because I have leopards on the brain. I thought I saw a leopard, but that would surely be impossible in that tree. No, I'm imagining things, aren't I? No, look, there was definitely movement, but there's no leopard. Sorry. All right, everybody, nobody panic. I'm going to change diagrams quickly. Give me one second. Well done, Darby. I'm going to change your diagram for one moment. 
and I'm going to show you what an elephant's foot, no I'm not, looks like because everything's fallen down. We've, we have a very advanced setup here. Okay, so I can't put it vertically because otherwise it would not fit. So we've got an elephant's foot lying on its side and I just wanted to show you a proper diagrammatic example of what we often talk about and unfortunately I've messed up the alignment of everything so now it's all showing the borders but they're, they're the little bones of the foot the way that an elephant's foot is structured allows it to rest upon that fatty cushion so an elephant actually does walk on its tiptoes we tell you this all the time but I just thought I'd give you a little diagrammatic example of exactly how that works and the way in which their feet are adapted to bear the weight it allows the toes to spread out and most of the weight to actually be borne and um, cushioned by that giant piece of fatty connective tissue which is essentially what that is it's a fatty connective cushion now there you go several several diagrams on elephants there's another one on elephant ears but I think we're gonna leave that one out because otherwise it's a, a vast amount of information to actually take in I think probably a little bit too much so whenever you see an elephant walking along if you see them spreading out their weight and the way that their feet expand to cushion their weight you'll be able to picture exactly the way in which their bones and their skeleton is adapted to do that and when you see them feed you'll be able to think about the trunk. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating.